Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Hope you had a good night's sleep. This is me, Will Jewell. I'm a consultant for anesthesia and perioperative medicine. I've been practicing for, well, as Chris alluded to slightly in one of his talks, for over 20 years. I've been for over 24 years. Uh, but then I look young. Yeah. I'm <laughs> glad we're all agreed on that. Um, so what I'm hoping to do today is convince you that general anaesthesia is fairly safe, but regional anaesthesia is exceedingly safe and is better for a lot of reasons. So how many anaesthetists here? Anybody who has anything to do with anaesthetics? Who doesn't know how an anaesthetic works? <laughs> puts you to sleep within 15 minutes, actually five minutes to be fair. So that's a great journal, so do get that. So wouldn't it be wrong not to start the speech? And this is one of my favourites. This is the great bard, William Shakespeare from Hamlet. To die to sleep, to sleep her chance to dream. There's the rub, for in the sleep of death that dreams may come. Any Shakespeare scholars here? Anybody read Shakespeare? <laughs> so what he's basically saying is, <clears throat> there's sleep, there's death, there's dreaming, and it may be that there is a, a, a fairly slim difference between sleeping and death, and he might dream, he hopes he might dream during death. So the takeaway message is really, and you're going to hear these words, you're not going to hear death too much, but you're going to hear about sleeping, and you're going to hear about dreams, because dream is quite important. Right, this is where we get very technical. So I'm going to play a little bit of music here. Oh, wrong bit. Let's move it on. This is a song by a group called Fleetwood Mac. And it says, Tell me lies, tell me sweet little lies. Tell me lies, tell me lies. It's quite poignant actually because the lead singer died this year, Christine McCree, um, at the tender age of 79. So, the other person I'm sure you all recognise, our glorious ex Prime Minister Boris Johnson, he told us that by leaving our nice group in Europe, we would be better off. What an awful guy. They were maxing our lies, but what I do often to my patients is I say, I'm going to give you some medicine that will put you to sleep. And to be honest, that is an awful lie. And it's an awful lie for these reasons. This is your brain, and the cortex, which is a bit at the top, is the bit that tends to go to sleep when you sleep. And all the other bits, which are your medullary oblongata, your thalamus, which lies in here, and your midbrain, sort of stay quite awake. And there's good reason for that, because they control your heart and lungs, and lots of the vital bits of your body that need to continue while you're asleep. But anesthesia puts those to sleep as well. <coughs> so a more truthful phrase would be, I'm going to induce a coma, a chemically induced coma. It doesn't go down quite so well with patients, does it? They're going to put you to sleep, going to do a chemically induced coma. So we tell them this awful lie. But it does come back to bite you on the derriere sometimes. So let's move on. So, Basically, we define, whenever I'm going to give an anaesthetic, I think, can I give local? And the patient says, wait, can it be regional? Which is what we're going to talk about, which is putting parts of the body, making parts of the body insensate or numb, so they can't feel it. Can we just give them some sedation with some painkillers? Or do we need a general anaesthetic? So every time I do an anaesthetic, I think about that, and then the one I choose, I decide, further decide what we're actually going to do to make that happen. So back to old Shakespeare, dream. And dream is important to us because this is what we're all about really, when our patients are having surgery. We want them to dream because we want them to drink, eat, and mobilize as soon as possible. And our anesthetic and our surgery are aimed at returning people to a normal function of life and a good quality of life. That's what we are. So dream, it. that is a take home message. Dream, so they want the patients to dream, drink, eat, mobilize. So this is the sort of stuff we use for general anaesthetic. Now, now don't be alarmed, I'm going to damn 
and then we'll have a seat. And this is part of my talk. It's like a political talk. I'm going to try and convince you that general anaesthesia isn't a great thing, and regional anaesthesia is the biz. I have several phrases for that, all of which are rude, so I probably will not say, but one involves dogs. <laughs> An anaesthetic machine, which you'll hear later, is an exceedingly expensive bit of kit. Laryngeal mask airways, endotracheal tube bits of kit. You've probably noticed already this is all plastic. Normal saline. Who uses normal saline? Hands up. It is not normal. There is nothing normal about normal saline. It is like having a bowl of chips and emptying a salt container on it. Okay? It is full of salt. It is abnormal saline. That's another message I'd like you all to take out. Saline is abnormal. And propofol, diprobound, which is becoming the world's most regularly used induction agent. So you need that to put you people to sleep at the beginning. Fantastic drug, puts your whole brain to sleep. If you give enough of it, the whole lot goes flat, okay? Now that doesn't sound too bad, I suppose, until you start to realise that there are a couple of groups who don't like that much. The very, very young and the elderly do not respond well to having their brain completely put to sleep. And they do not respond well to the low blood pressure that produces. So that's a great drug. It's also highly toxic if it gets into water. So it will kill fish. So don't give it to your goldfish if you need to do an operation on your goldfish. Okay? Expensive, lots of plastic, and a physiological insult is what we do when we anesthetize patients. <coughs> and in fact, our uh, Royal College of Anesthetists, so this is the group who command our, one of the two groups who command our anesthesia in our country, they produce a whole poster of things that aren't great for anesthesia. So, it ranges from things that are fairly common, so cut lips, um, loose teeth, sore throats, but also here, it hasn't focused very well, but this is about uh, not feeling yourself when you wake up, and particularly confusion and disorientation. And then it goes on to the rarer things, so when you put someone to sleep like that, and with certain operations they may need to be paralysed, so you have to ventilate them, so you put them on a ventilator, which is not too short the life support machine. So what I should be saying to my patients who come in for their operations, I should be saying, I'm going to give you a coat you can use coma, and I'm going to put you on a life support machine. How does that feel for you? They're out the door faster than a fast thing. Now this is quite important, I've put this up particularly uh, pertaining to our anaesthetics in Kenya, or the anaesthetics here particularly. So this is a system um, where there's your gases go in, so they're often nitrous oxide and oxygen, or oxygen and air. They go through a vaporizer, <coughs> which will produce the vapor which keeps the patient asleep, into a circle system. Now this is meant to be highly efficient. So there's a valve here, a valve here, the flow goes around. There's a bag for squeezing, and there is a CO2 absorber. So all you really need to do in theory is put a little bit of vapour in, a little bit of oxygen in, at least 250 mils, and the CO2 that you breathe out will be reabsorbed and it can go round and round and round. And what we do then is we turn this one down, uh, sorry, we turn this one up and this one down. Now the consequence of that, I could talk about this for a long time, I don't want to because it's only interesting to, to have the news this. Who's interested in the circle system? Yeah, I thought so, so we will, <laughs> we will pass by. <coughs> when you use this as it's most efficient, you need to monitor what's going on here. You need to have a vapour monitor here. And then you can be sure you are giving enough, and you can be sure that you're not wasting too much to the air. If you can't measure here, you make assumptions about this, and your flow needs to be high, and if your flow is high, you lose a lot more. So that's a bit of a waste of resource, isn't it? That's a bit of a waste of a very precious resource, but actually it's far more to it than that. Because shamefully, I don't like admitting this, and these just poison the atmosphere. So this uh, one hour of surgery using nitrous oxide is equivalent to 106 kilometers in your car. That is the effect of nitrous oxide on greenhouse gases. And this chart here shows you that there's a drug called Desert test rate, which we rarely use now, which is absolutely appalling for the greenhouse effect. Um, but so are isofluorine and sebofluorine. Sebofluorine, what's an isofluorine? 
So these gases go into the atmosphere and destroy the ozone layer. 106 kilometers, that's quite a way, isn't it? Every time you give someone an anaesthetic for an hour. So this is the bit that Shakespeare would just describe as, here's the rub. So for a mere, for a mere 20 to 40,000 pounds, so roughly 30 to 60 US dollars, versus 90 to 100, you can have an ultrasound machine. Okay. And what can you do with this ultrasound machine? You can do lots, it's portable. So you can actually do point of care ultrasound. So you can go to the bedside and ultrasound bits if you want to. And if you're very clever, you can do cardiac ultrasound with it. But that's not what I'm interested in. What I'm interested in is doing regional anesthesia with it. Because it has absolutely changed regional anesthesia from something that we use landmark techniques and we put a block in, we hope for the best. And my Austrian colleagues will remember, most blocks at that stage ended up in the general anaesthetic as well as the block. So I just want to dis, I just want to be rude about general anaesthesia again, because if you are using general anaesthesia, you nearly always need to issue painkillers. So a general anaesthetic for me has three components usually. There's a sleepy component, which I've talked about. There's a muscle relaxant component. And there is a sleepy muscle relaxant pain component, which is what I'm about to speak about. Okay. And often we use opiates. They're great drugs. In, I gave a talk about pain earlier in, the, in our stay here. And it really is about getting the right drug in the right dose and the right route. And then reassess. That is really important. So great pain relief, limited course. And you can give uh, opiates via a special pump where the patient presses a button and gets their own opiate. So that will keep them comfortable. And it, it means that there isn't a huge nursing staff input into it. But over a long period, they will be addictive. They cause nasty side effects like sickness and constipation. I, I don't know about your elderly population, but our elderly population hate being constipated. Cause respiratory depression. But this one is really important. They are immunosuppressive as well, if you give them regularly. So if you've got an infection, you're not going to do as well if you have a lot of opiates. And if you have a cancer, you're not going to do as well if you have a lot of opiates as well. So, um, they're great drugs, they should be used, but they need to be used with care. What are the cost of drugs? Well, for regional anesthesia, just some low anesthetic, which is, which is pretty cheap. For general anesthesia, the cost can escalate depending on what you've got. So we've got something that's not good for your brain. We've, got a, uh, we've been telling lies to our patients about what's going on. We're using painkillers that are actually probably quite bad for you. I have who, hands up who wants a general anesthetic? Yes, I thought so. No, <laughs> you have been listening and that is the case. This is quite a biased talk that I am trying to sell regional anesthesia to you. Right, so this is one of the patients we had, and this is a, a classic example. So he's broken his humerus, humeral fracture, plate. Patient remained, our glorious anaesthetist here, and uh, the patient remained awake for the entire procedure. And afterwards, he was in recovery, he was able to drink. He was able to talk, he felt himself, he was able to go back to the ward. So he was able to dream, dreamy mobilise, almost straight away. Now if you've had a lesser procedure, you probably could have gone home. Okay. Now there is, a, as Shakespeare would say again, there is a slight rub to this, isn't there? Because the block does eventually wear off, and then you do need painkillers. So I'm not saying ongoing painkillers isn't. But with a good block, you can get them over the worst of the pain. So here's my great friend, the brachial plexus. Do you all, do you all have a great love for the brachial plexus? Because I do. I'm sure everybody does. That would be only the right thing to feel about it. And all I remember about it really is roots, trunks, divisions, cords, and branches. Real Texans drink cold beer. As long as you remember real Texans drink cold beer, you're halfway there. And then this is my Marmu. So that's muscular cutaneous auxiliary radial median ulna. As long as you remember those. And then as you actually start playing with the break and practice, you need to know where the branches come off. So anatomy is quite important when you're doing your own. So I'll have a quick look at that. I'll try not to take too long. Complications from regional anesthesia. The wrong side block happens. So we put the block in the wrong side. <laughs> so the patient's having their right leg operated on, and we put it in the left and right leg. And that has become a real issue. And it is now something called a never event in our country. So that means you get a damp and spanking if you do that. You'll severely told off, 
and we have this um, policy of stop before you block. So before we do the block, we get the consent and we check that we are doing the right thing. Very likely to do. So it's an extension to do to make sure we do the right thing. Nerve damage. Well, ultrasound will reduce nerve damage. We can see where the nerve is now. When I first started training in the early 60s, when I first, let's try that again. When I first started training in the early 60s, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, it was actually the 80s, 90s, but we won't go into that. Um, we used to do it anatomically or with a nerve stimulator, and our plan was to get as close to the nerve as we could. Because if we got close to the nerve, we would deposit our low paracetamol around it, and it would work. But of course, if you get close to a nerve, you've got more chance of damaging it with your needle. Now with ultrasound, the approach is completely different. How far away can we get and still see our low anesthetic surrounding the nerve? And that's quite good because most nerves lie in fascial planes, so the planes between muscles, if you can get your needle into that plane, then the low anesthetic will naturally surround the nerve. Nerve damage, so nerve damage happens. The most common cause of nerve damage in theatre is? Both of those, so positioning of surgeons, I wouldn't like to put it in order because my dear colleagues are here and have played me. So, nerve damage, positioning is probably the most common. Surgery, nerve blocks yeah. down here. Okay? And that is because you can see what you're doing. That doesn't just mean the machine, it does mean you use good technique. So, as ever, the instruments help, but it is the learning and the technique that's important. How am I doing for time? Am I okay? Great. So, for using ultrasound, you need to know your anatomy, you need to practice your hand eye coordination. And mine has not been brilliant, but I've practiced a lot and it's got better. So, don't ever think I can't do this, I can't do this, because you can. It takes practice. Actually, my old teacher said it's not practice, it's good practice. Good practice makes it perfect, not just practice. And pattern recognition. So, we'll have a look at some patterns. So this is a bloke who talks on a website, so all this is available on the internet, which is absolutely amazing on YouTube. This is the New York group, nice aura. And what you can see on the left here is a diagram of what the brachial plexus should look like. It's the artery. It's lying on the first rib, which you can see there. And then the plexus is lying lateral to it. And that is that occurs in well over 95% of people who live their lives there. Sometimes it lies a little bit more over the top and sometimes sliding to the other side, but that is very predictable. This is what the ultrasound looks like. So when I first started doing it, it looked like a snowstorm to me, but pattern recognition allows you to suddenly recognise what is there. So I would see that medium and say that's a very good practice. Okay? The nerves have a characteristic pattern, and if you slightly change the angle to them, you can slightly change their appearance, unlike any other structure. So just with training, and I, you know, I'm not a genius, uh, and I'm not particularly brilliant, but I've practiced, and I've learned pattern recognition. So that's not too difficult. And then what we can see here is a needle coming in, and this big black splodge there is a local anesthetic. So an ultrasound is really good at this differentiating different densities. So once you get a little bit of local anesthetic in there, it starts surrounding things, so the picture becomes clearer and clearer and clearer. So uh, what, are we, what are we using? We're using a needle with a small piece of plastic in it, a syringe with some low in it. And that's, uh, that's what the environmental waste is and actually what the cost is. So this is another gentleman, because I couldn't find it. I did have a picture of someone we did as a day case. This guy is very memorable, <laughs> because I shouldn't laugh really, but he had a bit of a punch up with a hippo following uh, a close relationship with a bottle of whiskey. And um, he told the story that he, um, he was coming home from the park to his home and the hippo attacked him. Um, I think it was when I told me that he was lying in bed and the hippo broke in through the window and attacked him. But either way, the poor bloke had broken his, both his arms, uh, one arm, no, both his arms, through his hand and his leg. And he got a block on the left and the right, which is quite unusual, and he got a block for his leg as well. And he was feeling great afterwards. But the reshine season will allow you early discharge. It has a very high patient satisfaction. Now, patient satisfaction is a funny old thing, isn't it? If you, and I think this is quite an important lesson to learn, if you tell your patient they're going to be in terrible agony 
after the operation and they wake up uncomfortable, they'll be quite satisfied. Whereas if you tell them they'll have no pain at all, they wake up with a bit of pain, they won't be satisfied. So patient satisfaction scores always be slightly aware of it, depends what their expectations are. But the bottom line is the they were all quite happy with it when you explain what the advantages and disadvantages are. You always need to realise that this is going to wear off. And this is one of the things about regional analyses, it doesn't make me feel completely happy because I like to know that I have left the patient comfortable and they will continue to be comfortable. With regional analyses, the patient will be numb on the ward for anything for half an hour to four, five to six hours. And you need a, a written plan to say that at this point, you will start doing painkillers. So when, when, we did hip, when I did hip replacements, I used to write in my drug chart, give the painkillers where the feet move. Because as soon as the feet start to move, the rest of the leg, the leg is coming back, and that's a good time to do it. Alternatively, you can just continue to give pain for the whole way throughout. So that all depends on logistics. There, is, uh, there are several papers showing that the surgery outcomes in hand surgery are better under regional anesthesia. And that is probably by blocking your synthetic nervous system, you improve the blood supply to all in. And blood supply is really good, isn't it? It provides oxygen, it applies, and it supplies um, things that fight infection, white cells, so on so forth. Right, so I hope I have convinced you that it is safer, it is cheaper, less drugs, it is environmentally far more friendly, high satisfaction, and actually I quite enjoy doing it. I find it satisfying. Uh, that's, I was going to say that's the most important thing, but I won't say that. Uh, good. Having said that, general antibiotics are exceedingly safe. So if you do need one and you're not under six months or over 90, you should be fine. Now, I'd like to, any questions about that? And we're going to hand over to Beth for the second part of this talk. Dr. Beth is going to tell us a little bit about some regional anesthesia in ED and also the use of one of my favourite drugs for Italy. That is for giving to patients, not my personal use. Any questions at all? Oh, God, it's always the same. <laughs> no, no questions? <coughs> yes, question. Um, in the under six month age group, are yes. opposing to use uh, visual anaesthesia, or is there a safer alternative than general anaesthetic? So, yeah, the, the young are difficult, aren't they? Especially as I've already said that they're quite <coughs> So you can use both, obviously, you can use both, but actually um, try and keep a child still, try and keep it right. There's been lots of um, lower lip surgery done under spinal in small children, and it is, it is one of those things, if it is done regularly, and the whole team know about it, and what to expect, then that is fine. But actually, for a surgeon trying to operate on something while the child is screaming, usually because it's hungry, or it's fed up, or... Uh, for whatever reason children do scream, it's a natural process. That is incredibly stressful, so I have never ventured down that route. But there are some specialists who do. I'm not sure they could say their outcomes are any better. Um, what children don't, a lot of children don't like waking up with a numb bit, it distresses them quite a lot. And I will use regional anesthesia in an age group who I feel understand the consequences of it. They're quite happy in the, um, early teens, and I have gone below, certainly, with children who general anesthesia have become riskier. I presume, yes. problem. I was going to say, presumably giving a child a, a, a block is difficult to mess and put them to sleep in the first place. Yeah, no, absolutely, there is that as well, there is that as well, yeah. Uh, Dr. Will. Yes. I'm just a simple <laughs> 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 Yes. Can you explain why you would give a spinal and lower level blocks? Why you give a spinal so you give and a blocks? And then you do blocks? Yes, yeah, so the, the spinal anesthetic will make you completely insensate from the level depending on how much you give, how fast you give, and which drug you use. And that will last a fairly predictable time when we are talking, you may squeeze. So pain relief isn't just. You've got no pain and then you'll start to get pain. There are grades between, so you may be that they would find the surgery painful, but postoperatively it's not painful. But the bottom line is the spinal will probably last two to three hours, but a block will last six to eight to ten to twelve hours. So the blocks we put in are really there to provide better postoperative than we give. Thank you, good question. Any long-term complications of blocks? Sorry, Long -term, long -term, long -term. Right, so the only real long-term 
certain complications, nerve damage. So that is why it's so important not to, to have the mindset of I'm going to try and get the nerve around that nerve and not get too close to it. But actually, nerve repair is about, so nerves don't repair if you, very well if you cut them or you split them or you take a piece out. Because as Rob said at the beginning of our visit, a nerve, the inside of the nerve is like spaghetti. And those bits are spaghetti. So you've got a tube of spaghetti and then you cut it and then you try and match those bits of spaghetti together again. And not all the spaghetti is the same, so there are three different colours of motosensory autonomic. So you can imagine how difficult it is to get those back together when you do a nerve repair. But if you have just bruised it and you cracked it, but not cause structural damage, then it's more, far more likely to repair. Yeah. But we do tell all our patients there is a risk. That risk is roughly one in 5,000. But, if your technique is good, it's far less than that. Far less than that. Very good question, thank you. Yes, um, you mentioned on that uh, last patient, you did a bilateral block yes. on both shoulders, but you mentioned that's rare. What are the contraindications to doing a bilateral Right, so it's rare because the brachial plexus has a root from five, and, and also the phrenic nerve lies across your scaling muscle. So the nerve transcendent can spread up and block your phrenic nerve, which is what controls your diaphragm. So if you numb one, it's quite common to numb one, the patient will say they're a little bit short of breath. But if you numb both, they might well say that they're very short of breath, especially if they have a large abdomen and they have respiratory disease already. So it's quite rare to do that, but these were staged, so it makes it less so. So I think the first operation took about an hour and a half, and then the second similarly. So I didn't put them both in at once. If you block up here, it's far more likely. If you block down here, it's less likely. Any other questions? Right, okay, so you saw from the, uh, from the slide that I showed you, there's a lot of, an so there's loads of anatomy in the neck. The neck is quite important because it attaches the brain to the body. There's quite a lot of anatomy here, but there's less here. So this is probably the riskiest one, this is the second riskiest, and this is the safest. So yes, you can, so what's around here? Well, lungs, tissues, vessels, muscles, they can all be damaged. But now, instead of going blind, we can see where the needle is going. Because we always shout, show me the needle! Any other questions, Paul? Thank you. Um, but it, it was a drug that was used during the Vietnam War very, very effectively and then became available 
So you can never take away a drug once you've given it, but you can always give more. So those are the general doses that you need to remember. Um, so ketamine is used very, very frequently in Kenya um, because of the following, which I'm about to explain. So it causes a dissociative um, anesthesia, which is what Will was talking about with the brain and turning the brain off. So the drug that we use called propofol turns all of the brain off. So you, as you said, render the patient you know, unable to breathe themselves, unable to control their blood pressure. Ketamine causes a dissociative um, anesthesia. So it makes the patient not aware and it, it gives a lot of analgesia, but they're still able to perform all of the bodily functions. So they're still able to breathe themselves, their blood pressure remains um, unchanged or a little bit higher than normal. So when you're choosing how to use, whether you're going to use ketamine, you need to know how it works um, because that will help you make your choice um, as to which patients to give it to. So the first thing that I will say is that um, we use ketamine in our country a lot for patients that are cardiovascularly unstable, patients who are shocked with low blood pressures. Because if we gave our protocol, which we normally use, we would drop their blood pressure further. So ketamine doesn't have that effect. So if anything, it causes a slight tachycardia, it causes higher blood pressure, but it also causes an increased workload for the heart. <coughs> um, so you do have to exert some caution with patients with ischemic heart disease, for example. Um, the other thing to say is that it increases your metabolism, so it increases your cerebral metabolic demand, um, and it can increase the pressures in the brain and also in the eye. So it's something that we wouldn't maybe consider using in patients who have a, a cerebral bleed or an increased intracranial pressure or increased intraocular pressure. We also talk about it increasing salivation and inflammation. So you carry on breathing, which is absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, but so I, the first time I saw ketamine used was actually in Ethiopia, where they were using it to change furnace dressings, which I think is quite common. You know, some people in my um, because you can give it to children, um, and it gives analgesia and anesthesia. But they they can maintain their airway. If you are in a situation where you have limited monitoring for that patient it's a very good choice of drug. However, if you're going to increase your salivation and your lacrimation, and you are a child, the diameter of your airway is so much smaller than if you're an adult um, that you risk reducing your airway and reducing your ability to breathe because of all those secretions. So it's useful to know because you might also choose to give an adjunct such as an anti so something that dries up the secretions in the mouth. And the other thing to say is it has emergence reactions, um, which is one of the reasons why it's a drug of abuse. So hallucinations um, and things like that, it can be quite scary and quite unpleasant. But again, if you know that about the drug, you can, you can tackle that. So sometimes people give benzodiazepines with this um, in order to make it, uh, make the side effects less um, Yeah, so you carry on breathing, like I said. So it's a really good drug to use. And do you use it a lot? Can you guys just use one? Do you use it a lot? Uh, not so often, but we do use it. Yeah. So, to follow up on Will's talk, I'm also going to talk about two blocks that we do in the emergency department. So I don't want to follow my anaesthetic colleagues for any um, because um, you know, that's up to you, but it can be very useful in certain patients who present in the emergency room. <coughs> so I'm going to talk about two plain blocks and two fascial blocks. Um, so the first one is used primarily for fractured neck and femurs in the UK. So these patients are typically frail patients who uh, are more elderly, who are more likely to have comorbidities. So as Will has highlighted, there are lots of benefits of doing a block. Um, so this is from an app called Anso, which you can get, which is extremely useful, which some of my anesthetic colleagues have seen. So it tells you what it would be used for. So um, a, this particular block is useful if you have a femoral fracture or any significant thigh bruise. 
Um, there are a few, compli a few contraindications, so any allergies to the drug that you're giving or any significant impact you may have to when you're doing the injection. Um, and as you can see, it provides quite widespread cutaneous um, anesthesia, um, but also tackles, um, it will also cause weakness in the legs and also cause a motor block. So you need to care for your patient appropriately depending on that. So in the UK we learned maybe, which is the anatomy of where you're going to be injecting, um, so um, adjacent to the inguinal canal. So from the lateral side, maybe stands for nerve, artery, vein, wide fronts. Okay, so we all wear these in the UK, obviously, I'm sure. <laughs> Will's got on a lovely yellow pair right now. Indeed. Mm -hmm. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> there are, when I Google wide fronts on Google to see which picture I should put on the presentation, it um, feels quite a spectacle, so I believe this is one of the ten minutes. You'd be very grateful. Um, if you're doing, so if you're in the ED and you don't have ultrasound, you can do this using a landmark block. Um, so you identify the inguinal ligament, which is um, if you identify the asis and the pubic synthesis, and then you divide it into thirds, and you focus on the, the point where the, the lateral third is, and you come two centimeters down. Okay, have a feel there just to check the artery isn't hasn't for some reason, and if an anatomical variant, it would be very unlikely. Um, and then you put the needle directly down. So, this is what you'll be doing here. Okay, so you're away from your, from your nerve and from your vascular bundle. Um, and you get two pops. So you have a fascia lata and a fascia iliaca. So they're, so two fascia planes. And in young, fit, healthy people, if you're literally putting the needle down um, perpendicular, you get two hops. And then you can inject local anesthetic in. Um, and if you inject a big enough volume, that local anesthetic will spread all in this plane where the femoral nerve is. And it will also spread um, laterally to the lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh. And that can cause shrewd anesthesia to a patient that might be in significant pain um, for a pretty good period of time. So this image on the right is what you'd see if you ultrasounded, and you'd be able to come in, so this is your needle, and you'd be able to come in, visualize the nerve, and put slightly less volume, but be sure that you were putting anesthetic on the nerve. Um, so this is a relatively safe block, if you can do a pain block. Complications, so um, as we've mentioned before, nerve damage is a complication. Anytime you put a needle anywhere in the body, there's a risk of infection and bleeding. Um, and we don't often tell the patients about this, but obviously if you put local anesthetic into a vessel, um, that can cause significant problems. I put a brief thing up here about local anesthetic Um This is really just from my anesthetic colleagues. Um, so local anesthetic anesthetic when severe is um, an extremely significant anesthetic emergency. Um, and just so that you know, we left behind some of this intralipid. Um, I left a bit of reality. Yeah. So um, if we would love for you to be able to continue doing the blocks as we've been doing the last two weeks. Um, and so there's some intralipid in, in case of emergency. Um, so the last one is this one. So this is really useful. So we have a lot of patients, uh, again, elderly front patients who come with rib fractures, or occasionally people who receive chest compressions, chest compressions and have fractures of their ribs. So this is a block for that. So it's called an erector spinal block. Again, it's a plain block. And so we're targeting this area here. So this is a cross section of, um, so if you were cutting a patient this way, um, and we're looking down and we put local anesthetic in here to target these nerves from the nerve roots from the spine um, and then it will cause spread and it will down here and it will spread up various levels to target the intercostal nerves. This is the lady this time. Um, so you're looking to cause a block um, which will cause an analgesia to the ribs here. 
So you can position the patients um, sitting or they can be lying. And what you're aiming for is to locate um, the transverse process of the spine. Okay? And it's, it's actually, on most people, it's not significantly deep. So this is the erector spinal plane. So you put the probe in the middle and you scan laterally and you're putting the needle down so it touches the rib and then you're injecting the local anesthetic on the rib. So um, Priyanka spoke about um, pneumothorax. So it's important to know where your pleura, up, pleura is. So this is the, the lung. So it's really important that when you bring the needle down that you come onto the rib. So it's interesting that, Rip, um, that Will spoke about the chap who'd been attacked by the husband because he had quite a lot of those kinds of that we knew that day. So it's really important to calculate the right basis for your patients. So I just put this up as a reminder um, about how to calculate the basis. So for some unknown reason, like an anesthetic is given in a percentage dose, but also in a milligram dose, which for students can be um, can be quite difficult to get scripture. So I just put that up there um, for anybody that wants to remind them. Um, essentially, the, the take home message is that if you put adrenaline in with your local anaesthetic, you can give significantly more. So um, some of the surgeons were asking me if they could have. Um, so we often put local anaesthetic in our block and then also in the skin. And the surgeons were asking me if they could put a significant volume by putting the adrenaline in to reduce it. So it's really important that you know your patient's weight before you give any sort of local anaesthetic. And then this is just a reminder, if you're going to do any sort of sedation to reduce any fractures, um, that ideally you need the patient to be monitored. Now we spoke about ketamine and how actually we know that the patient's blood pressure will remain relatively normal, their heart rate will remain normal or high, and they'll continue to breathe. So ketamine is really useful um, medications to use in the emergency department. Um, I think you guys also use the gazolam um, in order to, to um, form um, conscious sedation. In the UK, we are taught that we need to monitor the patients with at least four pieces of monitoring. I appreciate that's not available outside of the interview, um, but I just put these pictures up to remind you. Um, However you're able to monitor the patient, so whether or not you do have any kind of CO2 in addition to your pulse oximetry, your blood pressure, and your ECG monitoring, um, the important thing to say that it should be controlled um, and the patient should maintain their airway at all times. Ideally, you have one person to give the sedation and monitor the patient and the other person to do the procedure. Um, so um, if you can phone friends to help you with this, and I know there's a lot of independent practice. Um, <coughs> let's face it, health, healthcare systems pretty much everywhere are under staff. Um, but if you can phone your friends um, and help with that, um, then that would be better. Um, so I don't know whether I have encouraged my ED colleagues to bring the anesthetic department if they need help. Maybe I've added to the point, I'm very sorry. Um, but it, in the future, so once the blocks once um, the department has um, everything they need and has happened with the blocks that we're doing here, it might be something to think about in the future for those questions. Does anyone have any questions? Or will they do what you're saying? No, it's complete. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. 
that our previous techniques have had us injecting into vessels when we didn't know about it. But nerve stimulator is a great adjuvant sometimes, and I actually use it for teaching because when you're doing an auxiliary approach, you're basically picking off marble, you're picking off the nerve, and I can demonstrate that here is the medium, here is the radial nerve, so you can just say that we're near the radial nerve, we're near the young nerve, we're near the medium nerve. So you can actually demonstrate that that nerve is what you say it is. So it's, it's actually one of my off sound keen colleagues poo poo it a bit, but I think it's a has a place. But just remember with the nerve stimulator, if you're the amount of stimulation you get is not necessarily related to how close to the nerve you are. So you can be very, very close and not get too much stimulation or a little bit away and, and uh, not get your nerve to spread where you want to be. I know it's, it's sometimes difficult to get blood quickly um, quickly enough. 
and uh, I'm going to relate it that uh, as part of the things we wanted to do in this company, we have achieved a lot in terms of savings. And it is not something we, as, as the, the team knows that we do on a regular basis when we do our camps. We haven't been doing this a lot as part of our camp. But as we did the preparation, as Darren and <coughs> Christopher will remember, we did emphasize that we really want to do savings. And I think from where I have been assessing it, I think we have done a really good job of it. And I, I'm sure I'm talking for everybody when I say it has been very beneficial. And it comes out pretty well. Some of the issues are new, some of the issues are just not And it comes out extremely well when we have this kind of talk. And it's not just theory, it's action, because medicine is science and must be practiced as such. So you've got to look at the basis for which we do things. So we really can do a very good block, but you can't tell us what he's trying to block. We just see the link going on. I think that 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 becomes witchcraft, but very simple. So we won't see the science by none of So thank you very much. I was hoping to tell you that you thought it was magic. I wouldn't tell you too, too much, so you skeletal. Who are me? Who are me? I think this really has come from And I want to say, I hope. It would be possible, especially because Joe is here. Joe is really good at, at, at organizing our services, <coughs> both physical and virtual. That it should be possible, even when our colleagues go back to UK, to continue with probably a weekend organizing, but I believe that's possible, to organize, even if it's going to be a Monday CME, where we have our team having this session. And I'm sure that Joe can organize that. And we can agree on what topic we want to discuss. It is an orthopedic topic. And I ended up proposing a topic when we used to have meetings and we used to have meetings in every week. We asked the teams to decide what they want. So how do I know what the residents want? Why would I want to tell them what they want? So Dr. Masi and the team will decide what they want. So if they say the university is what we will go to discuss. I believe in this era where uh, virtual things can be done, I believe we should be able to continue these things. And I don't think we necessarily need to wait to have the next uh, come for us to continue this. And I think it's good for them. And remember the giver, for example, the people who present, they receive more than the giver. So they, here we say, we get more blessed when we give, we get more blessed when we give and when we receive. Because we need to give a talk and to care for them. So if we are trusted a little, then we sharpen yourself. So I think, and I propose, because is a democracy, that if people feel that it's good to do so, that we may uh, continue to have a series at intervals that people can agree on, and I believe that our very able to turn down and we will be able to organize that. So for me, it's just to thank the team, both the, the givers and the receivers, for having agreed to attend this uh, meeting, especially because we are juggling many things. The work, and responsibilities, and yet, and we're able to do this. And let's be proud of it. And uh, so I want to thank everybody and wish you well. I know today is the last day, but like I've just said, because we're going to, uh, to continue this CME series, as we do all the others, and I know there are many, many CMEs we do in this hospital, but I think we can slot in, maybe at least a frequency, CMEs for uh, future health. Thank you very much.